in many ways, local governments constitute the heart of American democracy. In this course, we'll unpack why this might be. The role of local governments has changed dramatically during the rise of the administrative state, both in scale and function. As the role of central government has grown and expanded, so has the role of local government. Census reports indicate that there are more than 89,000 local governments in the United States. These include cities, counties, townships, and special districts. These changes in local government have created governance challenges for local administrators. At a formal legal level, cities, counties, and special districts are presumably the creatures of the state, little more than administrative subdivisions. But over the decades, the granting of home rule charters and the growth of legislation that allows differential treatment of jurisdictions has given cities, counties, and special districts considerable autonomy. It's common now for larger jurisdictions to hire their own lobbyists to fight state legislation that may have an adverse consequence for local autonomy. These cities, counties, and special districts in most states have organized into their respective separate associations, which spend much of their time lobbying the state legislature for the interest of their member jurisdictions. The growing independence of local governments, combined with their increase in numbers, has added to the complexity of local communities. Instead of having one unit of government provide an integrated array of services, many citizens in local jurisdictions find themselves increasingly served by separate fire, water, police, library, and other special districts. When added to an already complex array of cities, counties, and townships, administrators face important challenges as they seek to manage significant differences of opinion over annexation, growth, taxation, public safety, transportation, and any number of major interjurisdictional issues. Since the New Deal, five factors have greatly influenced the growth and autonomy of cities and special districts. Let's take a quick look. First, President Franklin Roosevelt began the process of expanding local jurisdictions by encouraging the creation of public corporations to float revenue bonds as a way of avoiding municipal defaults. Second, the impetus for expansion of cities and special districts occurred under pressure for economic development in the post-World War II period. The expansion of industry and housing, for example, caused the real estate industry to reorganize and apply political pressure to establish new cities and special districts. Race played heavily as a third factor in the expansion of local jurisdictions. It was common practice prior to the 1950s for neighborhood improvement associations to create restrictive covenants that excluded individuals on the basis of race. The U.S. Supreme Court declared in 1948 that race-based restricted covenants were unconstitutional, and this encouraged cities to try to bypass the ruling by using their zoning authority in new and creative ways. Fourth, new pressure to expand cities and special districts occurred under President John F. Kennedy. Federal aid to cities almost doubled during this period. It came from programs for housing, urban renewal, mass transit, education, job training, poverty, model cities, and grants and aid. These initiatives yielded two consequences. First, they changed the expectation of the role cities would play in meeting social needs of the community. And second, these new programs increase the complexity of local government and place new challenges on local government leaders. The fifth factor that spurred the growth of cities and special districts was the significant increase in state and local taxation during the 1960s. Starting in 1961, taxpayers at the local level experienced the largest increase in taxes. This increase burdened businesses and residents to create new cities and special service districts as a way of avoiding the taxes. The expansion in number, complexity, and the role of local government jurisdictions since the New Deal has greatly increased the challenges for those who govern. At an administrative level, they have to coordinate more of their work with other jurisdictions. First, there was a resurgence of support for less intrusive government that reduced the regulatory and financial burden on individuals and property holders. Second, the call for less government was advanced by those who were worried that the growing debt and escalating retirement costs of state and local government. Finally, the call for less government was fueled by a general philosophical belief that democracy was safer when government was smaller. 
Taken together, these forces for change have resulted in movements and call into question the capacity for governments to be the primary agent in solving society's problems. New public management, referred to as NPM, took the business or market model as the standard for measuring government success and has applied it in successive waves of administration reform since the early 1980s. There has been a concerted effort over the past three decades to reframe the model of public administration from a rule-centered system of accountability to one that makes government run more like a business. This movement, called New Public Management, strives to make the services provided by government more responsive and accountable to citizens by applying business-like management techniques with a strong focus on competition, customer satisfaction, and measurement of performance. There's a general agreement among scholars and practitioners alike that these efforts to measure what gets done have produced a variety of worthwhile results. Measures of efficiency and effectiveness have inspired managers, supervisors, and frontline employees to improve their capacity to diagnose and correct operational problems. An emphasis on performance management has heightened interest in creating systems that improve the overall management and governance of political entities. Performance management systems have expanded to embrace an increasingly larger array of values, including cost and efficiency measures. But there are two major weaknesses of using the private sector business principles to improve performance of government, regardless of what gets measured. First, there's no common denominator, such as profit, market share, or return on investment, that can serve as the basis for comparisons across a wide range of criteria that build trust and legitimacy among citizens in their political institutions. Furthermore, efficiency, effectiveness, and responsiveness to citizens are not the only consideration. Values like fairness, equity, protection of rights, and transparency play important roles in determining the legitimacy of political institutions, processes, and outcomes. The second weakness of using private sector models for improving government performance is that the public sector is comprised of increasingly fragmented structures of authority, making private market approaches ineffective in delivering great public service. To summarize, the new public management agenda is based on a truncated view of the purpose of government. Government is not simply an agent of accountability to citizens or an agent of efficiency and effectiveness. It is also responsible for collecting the values of the community and creating integrated responses to those values across increasingly fragmented government systems. New Public Governance, or NPG, emphasizes the importance of taking a collaborative approach with partners within and across the public, nonprofit, and private sectors in providing public services. This movement emphasizes three trust and legitimacy building characteristics of public governance that are ignored and undervalued by new public management. First, new public governance is value-centered. It argues that the goal of government is to promote the larger common good. New public government is interested in advancing the value created by the whole of government activities, not just improved efficiency, effectiveness, or responsiveness in the implementation of a given program. This shift has broadened the objectives of performance management and measurement to include service outputs, satisfaction, outcomes, a wide variety of substantive political values, and ultimately citizen trust and the very legitimacy of government itself. A second characteristic of new public governance is that it emphasizes the importance of creating government processes that facilitate the generation of implementable agreements among wide-ranging stakeholders who may disagree on what courses of action will produce the maximum public value. This is because NPG views politics and the politically mediated expression of collectively determined preferences that citizenry deems valuable, a sharp contrast to the philosophy of NPM, which views the politics as the aggregation of individual preferences. A final characteristic of new public governance is that it views the creation of the public good as the co-production process involving public, private market, and nonprofit sectors. Under this model, the role of government is not simply to regulate, distribute, or redistribute public benefits, but to serve as a catalytic agent to invest in private and nonprofit stakeholders in shared ownership of the public good. 
This can take the simple form of community policing programs or a much more complicated form of network governance, such as a watershed management over a very large geographic area involving multiple stakeholders and structures of authority. It's important to distinguish new public governance's approach and new public management's approach to partnership within the private and nonprofit sectors. The latter is interested in primarily using the private and nonprofit sectors to deliver a service cheaply, efficiently, and effectively, while NPG is interested in enhancing the capabilities of local governments as a mean of building civic infrastructure and overall capacity of community to be self-authoring. As you can see, new public governance is more emergent and bridges aspects of the nonprofit sector with aspects of the market model. The following five stages of evolution include distinguishing characteristics of public administration philosophy over time that has shaped public administration today. We call the first stage pre-classic because it precedes the conscious creation of public administration as a formal field of study and captures what leaders are expected to do when undertaking nation building or state building. Studies of the role of public administration during this period document the importance of administrators who use their discretion to assist founding political leaders in building the trust and legitimacy of the public order. Classic public administration represents the emergence of public administration as a distinct field of study. It has its origins in the populist and progressive areas of the late 1800s. This new approach attempted to overcome three major problems long associated with government bureaucracy, excessive administrative discretion, special interests, and inefficiency. New public management became the dominant paradigm in the 1980s. New public management succeeded in accomplishing multiple goals, among them increasing government efficiency, improving service access and delivery to citizens, and downsizing government while expanding the private and nonprofit sectors. New public management placed an emphasis on customer service, the need to foster professionalism and accountability in public administration, and the important role of leaders in creating and maintaining high-performance organizations. The critical responses to the deficiencies of classic public administration and new public management spawned new public governance. New public governance represents a shift in focus from what it takes to make things work in a vertical structure of authority to what it takes to make things work in horizontal structures. These horizontal structures are represented by cooperative agreements between and among public agencies, nonprofit organizations, and participating entities from the market sector. Finally, values-based performance governance focuses on collective leadership with collaboration and agreement shaping administrative results. A strong external focus, mainly on meeting citizens' needs, drives the delivery of quality service. This commitment requires agencies to double down on a commitment to communication, respect, equity, and open access aimed at meeting the diverse needs of their community. Legitimacy is found through active trust building and transformational leadership. In delivering public value, it's important for administrators to be mindful of these historical legacies as they can draw upon them to inform, guide, and validate their work.